Sorry, I haven't done that faster. Okay. Um, and are there any questions about the final assignment? We're going to move people to the other way. question about this. Okay, I guess not. So I'll just, oh. <laughs> Sure, why not? Over here, right? Spread out. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, I should get started because there's a lot to cover. I'm sure I won't acknowledge it very well. But because I have to start by talking about the stuff I didn't get through last time. Um, so, um, so, I mean, because the reading for last time covered basically everything Kuhn says about normal science. And so, uh, you know, the book is called Structure of Scientific Revolution. So, um, you might think that like the main point was about revolution. Um, but I actually think that the main point of the book is the point about normal science. Um, I mean, it's certainly, uh, um, what seems to cover into coherence like the startling conclusion of the book is the conclusion about how normal science works. Um, and I think that's really true for Kuhn as well. Um, I mean, both in the sense that it's the most surprising like thing that he's saying, but also it's really, it's central to what he's really doing because um, he's really trying to answer the demarcation question. And the, you know, and the answer to it is that a mature science is a science that has a paradigm. And normal science is research under a paradigm. So like Kuhn's answer to what um, modern science is and why it's so different from other creative fields and so on and so forth is basically, the answer is basically about the nature of normal science. So, um, and I think, you know, so, the, the, the stuff about extraordinary science, which I'm hopefully going to get to at the end this time, and um, scientific revolution, which I mean, it can't be completely separated from extraordinary science. We're going to talk about it more next time. But like the stuff in the book about that is basically there to um, like make sure there isn't some loophole. Where you know, in the in the time of a revolution, science becomes popular, or something like that. Right. So it's like as Kuhn would call it a mopping up operation <laughs> for Kuhn. <laughs> hey, like this is the main. By the way, I I read somewhere. I'm not sure this is true that mopping up operation is a term that comes from like. Um, um, bombing in World War II. <laughs> that doesn't come out of like G 
janitorial. <laughs> it's like a mopping up for operations when you fly some of the four planes to bomb the last few things. <laughs> I, I don't know that's true. Anyway, so, um, but that's what it is, right? It's like, this is the main point, but then he has to show that, well, what about, you know, these strange cases? So, um, and I guess I'm emphasizing that because it's not that surprising given, like I said, the title of the book and whatever, that I think people often take the main problem raised by Kuhn or the main um, weird conclusion to be a conclusion about the nature of revolutions. Um, but again, I think from Kuhn's point of view and from Popper, the point of view of Popper and his followers, um, that's really not the most surprising part. So the, you know, so the surprising part again is like, what is the answer to the demarcation problem? And you know, so we ruled out accumulation answer, and you know. That seems to leave methodology, which is Popper's answer. Right? Accumulation is, you know, doesn't require methodology because accumulation, we just say what is science? It's like the activity that led to all the things we know now. <laughs> oh, by adding them one after another. Um, but if, if it turns out it doesn't work that way, that a lot of science was directed towards things that we don't know now because we don't think they're true. <laughs> um, that then it seems like, well, the answer must be it's, you know, it's not what you know, it's how you know. <laughs> right? And that seems to be the methodology. Um, but Kuhn is rejecting that too and saying that it's this thing called having a paradigm. Now, um, um, so, um, this, this difference is really like, this is not like a technical difference. This is, this is like a huge difference. Like, for example, education in a methodology it would be a matter of teaching rational principles. So it would be critical and open, right? Like how else can you teach rational principles? <laughs> um, um, you know, and as I mentioned before, it's true, Popper in person was maybe not always that open and, <laughs> and accessible to criticism, but, but like certainly based on this view, that's, that's the way you have to be, right? So, um, whereas Kuhn says real scientific education is both rigorous and rigid, and he compares it to education in Orthodox theology. <laughs> right? He says that's like the closest thing to it. Um, um, and uh, he says that. Scientists are persuaded by this education to stuff nature into boxes. Um, um, which I guess is another way of putting what he also puts by saying that except what, what accepting a paradigm does is to drastically re, um, restrict your vision. Right, like it changes, um, it, it restricts the range of conceivable outcomes from experiments, for example. You don't do an experiment not knowing what's gonna happen. You do an experiment knowing almost exactly what's gonna happen. There's just a little, you know, um, that you're trying to 
um, be more precise about. Um, uh, and like, I guess, I mean, this is important to understand, like, so what if that, what if what you expect, what if the experiment doesn't come out within that narrow range that you expect? So, right, so Popper's methodology suggests your response to that should be, oh, wow, now I'm finding out something. The world is actually telling me something, right? Like poking its way through my preconceived beliefs and whatever. But what actually happens, Kim says, is that um, the experiment is a failure. Right, that is, it reflects, as he puts it, it reflects not on nature, but on the scientist. So, you know, um, um, if you set up some apparatus that's supposed to me measure the charge to mass ratio of the electron or something like that, and it just, and it doesn't give you a consistent answer. Or it gives you an answer that's way out of the range that people consider possible. So it means your equipment's not working right. <laughs> right? It's not measuring what it was built to measure. Or you're not using it right or something like that. So, um, you know, if you observe the same asteroid three nights in a row, but you can't establish a consistent orbit for it. That means something's wrong with your observations. <laughs> it, it's got to have an orbit. <laughs> so, um, um, um So, you know, this sounds kind of like bad, actually. <laughs> I mean, uh, it sounds um, like it sounds bad, both in the sense that it sounds like we might not want to do it, and also it sounds bad in the sense that it's um, not rational, and therefore not free. Right? It's um, like you're not really thinking for yourself. Um, so, and I think, I mean, so Kuhn is a little bit, um, and, Well, I mean, there's two ambiguities about this, but like, so, so number one, who doesn't come, ever come straight out and say, and therefore you shouldn't do science or something like that. But I mean, he does, first of all, we know he stopped doing it. <laughs> um, and second of all, he, he uses terms like, he says science is oppressive. This is, at, I think, on page 20, let me, uh, Yeah. Um, given the textbook, however, the creative scientist who can begin his research where it leaves off, unless where it, that is the textbook, leaves off, and thus can concentrate exclusively upon the subtlest and most esoteric aspects of the normal, normal phenomena that concern his group. As he does this, his research communiques will begin to change in ways whose evolution has been too little studied, but whose modern end products are obvious to all and oppressive to many. Um, so, um, uh, 
there's certainly some indication that uh, Kuhn, um, at least personally, was not happy in the field, that he was frustrated, that he asked himself, why am I measuring these things that are so un intrins intrinsically uninteresting? <laughs> Um, um, but he doesn't, he certainly doesn't anywhere in the book say, oh, science is bad, it should be abolished or something like that. Um, he doesn't, like, um, um, and I guess, you know, later on when people asked him more pointed questions about this, he, he did, he, he said, oh no, I never meant to say it. I'm just explaining how it works. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's really hard to, 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 in reading this book, not to get the impression that that's what he's saying. So, um, but like leaving that aside, I mean, even if we don't worry about whether people should be doing this, there's, you know, this description of how science works raises a serious question about why people even want to do it. Um, so it's, um, um, the, like, the, the way normal science allows this special kind of progress so, I mean, you know, like the, to the overall question, why does science make progress the way it does? Kuhn has a two part answer, basically. One part is, one part is why does normal science make progress? And the other part is why does science make progress through revolutions? So he's gonna put off explaining why or in what sense science makes progress through revolutions until later. But for normal science, you know, why does it make progress? Well, because people are, um, you know, uh, freed from the need of thinking about what they're doing <laughs> and enabled to, or, you know, any kind of big picture questions, so to speak, and enabled to focus on these really special problems that everyone already thinks are going to be solvable. And the question is just how to solve them. Um, um, and, you know, the, the paradigm has a theory associated with it and these various other pieces, but the, the main thing it does with all those pieces put together is to tell you what those problems are and how to solve them. But the question is, like, why do you want to solve them? <laughs> um, so, uh, um, you know, like we understand why someone would want to do well, maybe there's even some question here. We certainly understand why someone would want to do this. Right? Add to the store of knowledge about the world. That sounds useful. <laughs> Interesting. Whatever. We, you know, um, we can also understand why, especially given that things don't work this way, someone would want to do this. Right? Like, as I kept saying, this is basically is like advice on what to do when you find that, like, you are forced to adopt certain presuppositions and you can't justify them. Well, like, at least test them. Um, so, I mean, there's already some question here about, and this has partly with Putnam's criticism of Popper, you know, there's some question about, uh, but does this, is this useful? <laughs> I mean, I think Popper tried to give an answer to that. It's sort of like, well, of course we believe it's useful. <laughs> um, we just can't justify it. <laughs> but, um, but it's certainly, even if it's not useful, it seems interesting. 
Right? It's like old conjectures, and we're in suspense. Will they be falsified or not? <laughs> um, this, um, it doesn't seem interesting. You already know what's going to happen. Um, so, you know, and I, I, I haven't gone into this deep in, this in detail, but like Kuhn does give this very long detailed explanation of exactly what kind of things go on in normal science. And it's interesting, and if, if I had time, I would talk about it, but I think I don't have time, but, it, but it, it's, you know, I mean, overall, what's going on is there's a framework of assumptions I mean, Popper and Kuhn agree with that, right? That the, the activities of science, you know, require a certain presupposed framework, which, um, I mean, I guess in a way, Carnegie agrees with that too, right? Like this paradigm is kind of like one of Popper's theories, and it's kind of like one of Carnap's languages. It kind of does both of those things. It, you know, like it contains certain expectations about what's going to happen, um, but it, it also contains certain like uh, vocabulary, the things that happen to be described. Um, so, uh, so like all three of them agree that you have to have a kind of framework like that, and the framework can't be justified, or at least. Can be justified in the same way that the results you obtain within the framework are going to be justified. Um, but what's different about how the framework is being used here is that um, everything you do is aimed at like. Making sure that the framework and the world agree with each other. <laughs> um, so, like, avoiding any question that um, um, that the framework doesn't tell you you should expect to be doesn't give you an expected answer. Right, and this is, um, I mean, so for example, in the, like in the evolution of chemistry from one stage to the next, could, points out that there are certain questions that are considered good questions in one stage. And then the next stage were not considered good questions. And then later became good questions again. <laughs> right? Like, why is this material a certain color? So, um, you know, like, um, at some stage, people like hoped to be able to answer that question using mechanism or you know whatever their paradigm was. But um, at a certain point, when the new paradigm took took over. It it was like part of that paradigm was that that's not the kind of question you can expect comes to me. Things are the color they are, right? And then much later, when switch to quantum mechanics, all of a sudden that becomes a perfectly good question again. Why is the thing the color it is? Well, you know, we have to see what kind of photons can be absorbed by the electrons in this material. Um, um, so Right, so but in the, in that in between phase, it's like it's not like um, you're discouraged from from asking that question because the paradigm doesn't like 
um, provide any expected answers to it or approved equipment that can be used to investigate it or whatever. So you just avoid it. <laughs> um, so like, um, So, so again, the question is why, why do this? It doesn't seem interesting. And Kuhn's answer is, well, actually, I mean, there's a perfectly well-known human activity where someone tells you that a problem can be solved and, you, and gives you rules more or less how it can be solved and what the solution has to look like. And it's called puzzle solving. And people, at least some people, really like it, <laughs> right? So, like, when you buy a jigsaw puzzle, there's no surprise. There's a picture on the box of <laughs> what the solution is. <laughs> um, so, uh, you're like, you're not testing anything, except you're testing yourself, right? That's and that's what the scientists are doing too, right? It's, a, it's not a test of how good the paradigm is, it's a test of how good the scientist is, right? So, like, you know, so the, with the jigsaw puzzle, you, you know what the solution has to be, and you know exactly um, um, how it has to be achievable, right? Like, who goes through some of the, the unspoken rules of jigsaw puzzle solving you know like you can't turn the pieces over you can't force them <laughs> so um 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 and you know and the rules of jigsaw puzzle solving don't have any use outside of creating a problem that's fun to solve. Right? It's not like they're justifiable by some kind of rational uh, methodology. It's just, uh, um, you know, that if you follow these rules, you have a challenging problem. So, um, you know, and I guess, although Kuhn doesn't really mention this, I guess maybe it's also important in jigsaw puzzle, puzzle solving and perhaps in science as well, that there's like a whole range of problems of different levels of difficulty. <laughs> yeah, like um, if you want, you can solve a lot of easy jigsaw puzzles or if you prefer, can spend years and years solving really hard jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> yeah. Does this only apply to normal science? This like kind of jigsaw puzzle analogy? Um, or does it apply to it? I, I feel like there are, if something is like groundbreaking science, then that maybe that you know puzzle picture you don't already have, you're kind of building it as you go. So, you know, that's as I said, that's why Kuhn has faces this mopping up operation he has to do, right? But um, that is, he has to explain what's happening. So there is a time when, when scientists stop doing this and start doing something else. But he, so that you have to figure out what the other thing they're doing is and why they're doing it. But you know, but, but before getting to that, like you know, it's so. Um, I mean. Uh, It's uh, undeniable that a lot of scientific work is is like this. You're, you know, you're trying to do something. Of course, it's not always or usually like a jigsaw puzzle where you know exactly what the solution is supposed to be. There's a range of solutions, and you're trying to figure out which one is the right solution. Something like that. Um, 
Um, but, um, you know, whether Kuhn is exaggerating or talking about something that only happens in certain fields of a certain period, or, yeah. So, um, well, I'm thinking about the example of like the experiment where they're just making the measuring device. And, you know, if it fails, then that reflects badly on the, the device. Um, if, if, I mean, a lot of science is like that probably, but isn't there kind of an, or couldn't there be a background assumption that trying to get more accurate measurements, whatever you expect from the paradigm, so trying to get more accurate, like, <laughs> Measurements of that would eventually eliminate any problems. Would eventually, like, like what reason is there to to try and get accurate measurements of things that are expected by the paradigm, except to find any, like, any problems? Like, oh, I see. You mean, isn't it? It isn't it? Maybe directed at finding anomalies. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, so this is like a kind of historical slash sociological question about what scientists are actually doing and why. I mean, Kuhn certainly claims and if you and offers evidence for the, the claim that um, scientists are not looking for fundamental novelties, as he puts it, and are intolerant of them when they when when someone proposes them and are distressed by them and want them to go away. <laughs> So, um, you know, as I was about to say, uh, like, is the science, has modern science always been like that? Is it always like that? But, I mean, he says, like, after listing what normal science does, and it's all this kind of puzzle solving, he says that this, I think, exhausts the activities of normal science. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think he has a lot, at least if you, you know, like without going and trying to do my own alternative history of science research, which I'm not going to do, but like taking his evidence at face value, at least, he has a pretty strong case for this, right? It's like, uh, look at how science education works. You're not told, and I mean, I have plenty of science and education and I can testify to this, right? You're not told, uh, oh, like, yeah, assume general relativity is true because we're looking for anomalies in it. <laughs> we're trying to test it and get rid of it. <laughs> right? It's like, this is how we know that the universe is now and you know and now here's some application that here's some hard problems we're trying to use to solve um, um. however i guess maybe i should kind of skip to this which is that um, this is Popper's, this is from Popper's response to Kuhn's contribution to the Popper Schilt volume, right? So I didn't assign Kuhn's contribution to the Popper volume, um, but there is one and Popper responds to it. And part of his response is this, I am prepared to admit now following Kuhn, the existence of routines in science and thus the existence of what he calls normal science. But I think that the very idea of a routine is uncharacteristic of science, and consequently that normal science is not normal, but uncharacteristic. I think that the phenomenon of a routine in science has become more prominent only recently, along with the mass production of scientists, 
And I think that Kuhn is projecting comparatively recent phenomena, which he has personally experienced, not only upon earlier periods, but upon the whole long history of science. Right? So, so Popper's response to this is, um, is like, yes, okay. And he says, it's important. I didn't realize this until I read Kuhn, that this is going on. But he says it's not, it's going on, but it's it's uh, pathological, right? And it's and it's not normal. And uh, I didn't copy this part down, but uh, he he speculates um, that the reason for perhaps for this uh, change and this new mass production of scientists is uh, the sudden need for many people trained in advanced technology, perhaps um, due to the modern arms race. <laughs> right, so Popper basically blames it on the military industrial complex. <laughs> so, um, uh, I might come back to that in the political like, things that are going on there. But, you know, so, I mean, who's right? Well, it, it's hard to say, except that I think characterizing what Kuhn calls normal science as a routine is um, somewhat missing the point. It's not like, right, it's not like Kuhn is saying that scientists are just following, uh, like, you know, scripts or something. <laughs> just doing the same thing over and over. On the contrary, he says that when something like that that can be done in science um, comes along, the scientists immediately outsource it to engineers if it's useful, right? So like, it's useful to be able to predict when the sun will rise tomorrow. And you can use celestial mechanics to do that. Um, but it's just the same problem over and over again. There's no challenge to it. <laughs> and so scientists don't work on that, you know, engineers work on making that more accurate. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, other things like that, like tables of the properties of materials and stuff like that. So he's not talking about a routine, he's talking about something that's I mean, look, even in the case of a relatively simple kind of problem, problem like a jigsaw puzzle, um, you know, um, it's, it's only challenging because you can't give just a routine for solving, right? I mean, there's certain things that you probably want to try first, like finding corner pieces. Yeah, right. But uh, you know, but beyond that, you know, you, you have to solve. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I don't think routine is the right word for it, but but nevertheless, you could it's possible that Hopper is right and that Kuhn is is projecting something that's really a local fact about science that, uh, you know, I don't know, it's hard to say. Like a lot of his best examples are from the um, 18th and 19th centuries, so, or even earlier, Copernicus, whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the best answer I can give to that question. So, um, Right, so anyway, so right, so that the motive here is puzzle solving. And you know, this is why I said when when Putnam tried to interpret what was meant by puzzle solving, where it was like, why would you call it puzzle solving? Well, you're trying to figure out what to put in here. And that's kind of like solving a puzzle. So I mean that's that's true, but it's a pretty superficial analogy. <laughs> right? It's kind of like solving a puzzle because there's something you don't know and you're trying to find something like that, right? Um, 
So, but I think Kuhn is, is comparing normal science to puzzle solving in a much deeper way. He's saying, like, as I said, a puzzle is a problem where you know uh, what type of solution it should have, and you know what things you're allowed to do in what order to solve it. And the question is, are you good enough to solve it? If that none of that comes out of this in, Put in Putnam's schema. Um, so, um, and okay, I mean, why do people like puzzle solving so much? So, uh, well, I mean, I don't know, except Kuhn doesn't seem to be very positive about it. Right? He, he, he describes, and he's not the only one who does this, he describes someone who is into solving puzzles as, as addicted to, to solving the puzzles. Um, and, you know, I mean, so we do tend to think of, of like someone who solves the same kind of puzzle over and over again as that it's something like an addiction. Um, that, you know, um, what it, I think in the sense that like, I mean, I don't know, so like, there is some interest in testing yourself against a puzzle to see if you can solve it. But how many times? <laughs> right? You know, like, is there some interest in testing yourself over and over <laughs> against the same kind of puzzle? Yeah. So we, we couldn't believe that doing science, like normal science, doesn't actually yield progress and that it's kind of just like we feel good about ourselves as scientists for doing this, but we don't actually yield. Well, progress for the world. It, well, okay, so progress for the world is one thing, you know. But does 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 normal science make progress? Well, yes, for sure it does, because but the paradigm defines what is going to count as progress, and what counts as progress is puzzles solved, <laughs> right? And the paradigm gives you a whole bunch of puzzles that should be solvable in principle. And as long as that keeps going, you know, like you're definitely making progress. <laughs> now, yeah, is it useful? So, I mean, so, so again, Kuhn says you're not doing it because it's useful. Like maybe that's why you got into science in the first place, because you thought it would be useful. And that's maybe he says why some people are frustrated after they enter science and they find that this is what you're doing. But um, you're not doing it because it's useful. He says, yes, science on the whole in the long run sometimes is useful, but he doesn't really explain why. And, you know, when he talks about, uh, and this is, you know, like the reason I keep emphasizing that, that engineering is outside the demarcation. Right. That engineering is outside is that like Kuhn seems to say that technology and mature science are two completely different activities. Very right? like he says at some point, you know, every society has technology and art and religion and whatever, but uh, modern science has only occurred in this one weird case. <laughs> So, uh, right, like somehow suggesting that, te that um, technology develops independently of science. Now, I mean, I don't know if that's plausible, but, but, but it is, I think it is, does seem to be what he thinks. I mean, when he does make any connection between them, he, it usually goes the other way around, right? Like he says, how uh, new developments in technology can spur paradigm change in science, can like draw attention to anomalies or something like that. Um, 
So, uh, and I guess he's thinking of the role of like people trying to build steam engines and the development of thermodynamics, stuff like that. So, you know, he's saying that the influence went this way. I mean, whether you really, um, you know, like there's no saying how this stream works without one of the kids. You know, it's like, it's hard to imagine that the kind of like craftsmen by trial and error could eventually create LCD screens. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that does seem to be what he's saying. So the usefulness is, if there is some, it's hard to understand where it comes from. And, um, right. So I mean. Um, and I guess the other kids, well, maybe I'll talk about this in a second. Well, maybe I should talk about this right now, actually. I don't know why I found this under extraordinary science. I can talk about it right now. So, like, um, So when he talks about the way normal science like restricts our vision or whatever, he says, um, the range of anticipated and thus of a similar dual results is always small compared with the range that imagination can conceive. So, you know, we have, on the one hand, we have like what the paradigm um, or I guess maybe I should say like yeah, let me just get, try it this way. We have like the things that count as puzzle solutions and then outside that we have the whole realm of what imagination can conceive. And um, um, that, by the way, I was just reading from page 35, sec section four, chapter four, but he calls them sections, I think, because he says that he's saying this is just an essay, not a full scale book. <laughs> And I'm going to write a full scale book later. So, um, but anyway, um, um, so this is from page 38. To solve a jigsaw puzzle is not, for example, near, for example, merely to make a picture. Either a child or a contemporary artist could do that by scattering selected pieces as abstract shapes upon some neutral ground. The picture thus produced might be far better and would certainly be more original than the one from which the puzzle had been made. Nevertheless, such a picture would not be a solution. Right, so like what's going on out here are the things that we've done by children and um, contemporary artists. Using their imagination, <laughs> conceiving of ways, for example, the puzzle pieces might make an interesting picture. Um, but uh, the people who are addicted to the puzzle solving are not interested in that even though he says it might be far better and would certainly be more original than what they are doing. Um, 
And, uh, you know, he discusses the history of art a little bit much later in the book. This is on page uh, 161. Um, For many centuries, both in antiquity and again in early modern Europe, painting was regarded as the cumulative discipline. During those years, the artist's goal was assumed to be representation. Critics and historians like Pliny and Vasari then reported with veneration the series of inventions from foreshortening through Chioscuro. I'm sorry, the, the PDF is kind of screwed up here. I'm not going to have time to that had made possible successively more perfect representations of nature. And then a little bit later on, only when the latter unequivocally renounced representation as their goal and began to learn again from primitive models did the cleavage we now take for granted, that is between art and science, uh, assume anything like its present depth. Right, so, so that is the reason he says contemporary artists is because he's, and I don't know exactly where he's drawing the line here, whether it's like with impressionism or cubism or whatever, but he's saying that, you know, at some point, uh, at some point art was inside this. And then, and this is interesting because I think it's the only case I know where it seems to suggest that a field has made a reverse transition from mature to immature, right? Back to being like children, or they learn from primitive models, as he says here, right? So, um, but the art was inside this and now has broken out of it. Yeah. It sounds like you say that art used to be like essentially what we now use a camera for, pretty much, where it's like we were trying to capture. An, uh, an image, but there was no real way to capture exactly. So for that reason, it was like solving a puzzle, trying to exactly mimic. But then now there's no need for that anymore. So we have relearned what art is, I guess. I guess he doesn't mention photography as a factor in, the, in this evolution, but you know, but it's not impossible that it has something to do with it. I don't know. But um, I mean, of course, you know, there's also artistic photography. It's not exactly so but well anyway and yeah i guess it's related to something i've had several grad students trying to work on fonts aesthetics and non-representational non art <laughs> Which is interesting because cos aesthetics seems like it's just made for explaining non representational art, but Kant himself is like very careful to make sure that it doesn't. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah, and I guess you can say that even though art, you know, after abstract expressionism, a lot of kinds of representation came back into, you know, that uh, that there's still no going back to puzzle solving. It's not like the best artist is the one who can make the most lifelike representation. Yeah. So is he saying like art is somehow paradigmatic also? Or what? I think he's. It sounds like he's saying. I mean, you know, that that like one paragraph there is is. Uh, pretty much all he says about the history of art. So I'm reading a lot in, but it sounds like he's saying that art at a certain point was or was like a mature science, and I guess had a paradigm. Or I, I'm not sure though. Maybe he's saying it was like technology. It's a little bit because there there was a clear goal. Well, was there? Was there? I don't know. But anyway. Um, um, yeah, that would make it different because technology obviously has a motive beyond puzzle solution. Um, but uh, now he seems to be comparing it to science, 
but I'm not sure exactly how the comparison works, like what the paradigm is. Yeah. I kind of think that it's like a paradigm situation because like people, I don't know, but when I look at like old portraits, I feel like the style kind of remains very similar. Um, like in like Western, in the Western tradition at least. And it's not necessarily like hyper-realistic even. Uh, like I feel like people didn't make radical like transition to trying to like truly represent what the soul looks like until like the modern era. I don't know, I mean, I can get on with this. I, feel yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I'm not well for that direction. Um, but they, I mean, but I guess like maybe if you looked at the history of art more, you could see things that are like, so yes, they're trying to represent the world more and more accurately, but there's something about like the um, artistic culture that, that like focuses attention on a certain type of representational problem as opposed to another, right? And then you could see whole periods of art where like it, you know it's a certain specific type of problem that you're trying to solve under certain rules and then they, maybe that shifts but i don't know if that's true or not and and, and i don't know whether food is claiming that or not but i do know he's claiming that contemporary artists are not like that and that they're immature like because they're like children or like primitive models and that therefore they have range, they have access to this huge range of what the imagination can conceive. Um, um, and what they're doing is original and not addictive, and perhaps far superior to what scientists are doing. <laughs> and um oh boy, I think you see this, but oh well, never mind. So uh what I'm going to say now is, is, is like very, uh, I don't know. It's like a whole bunch of unjustified connections. <laughs> but so, uh, so, but it has something to do with like, the, Thing I'm kind of getting around the edges of here, like what is Kuhn's position about science? What is his political position? Um, so, you know, uh, there's this idea, and I got this from a book I read by Todd Hitman. I'm not sure if it's really like a widespread thing or if it was just his idea, but, you know, he said that the movement in the 60s had two parts. The West Coast versus the East Coast. The East Coast was this is a very good place, uh, but sorry, the, the East Coast movement was political in a standard sense, right? It was like revolutionary. They wanted to have a revolution and change the structure of society. Um, whereas the West Coast movement was he puts it, this is the he now is Todd Hitler, not who, right? Who doesn't talk about this? Um, this all happened after publication of the structure of China Revolution. But the West Coast movement was expressive, right? So but it wasn't trying to aim to achieve political aims, it was uh, like trying to hold the summer of love, <laughs> right? And um. Um, and like in connection with this, and this is what really made me think of this in connection with Kuhn, that Gitlin quotes this slogan. So this slogan emerged from this weird group called the Situationist International, <laughs> um, which uh, um, actually was European. And I mean, this slogan apparently was was popular in Paris in May of 1968, but I guess it's like Gitlin uses it to explain what the West Coast movement was like. And the slogan is "All power to the imagination." Right. So as opposed to the political, all power to the people. 
these people are saying all power of the imagination. Why would you say that? Well, so here's another piece of like unreliable and possibly unconnected information. But this is from a Wikipedia article on the Situationist International <laughs> or the Situationists. Um, the Situationists possessed a strong anti authoritarian current, commonly deriding the centralized bureaucracies of China and the Soviet Union in the same breath as capitalism. Right, so the, the reason that they that they went in this direction rather than the direction of politics is that they didn't see any way out, any way towards freedom within any kind of political framework. So right, they, they thought that the alternative between capitalism and socialism, that um, you ended up with the same bad thing either way. Um, and so, like, what should you do? Well, you know, like, tune in, turn in, and drop out. <laughs> now, I mean, all of this is kind of, uh, like I said, first of all, this is all, you know, like, I just jumped a whole bunch of things without really justifying it. And it's sort of like, it's not like Kuhn was a hippie or something. I mean, certainly not in 1962. They weren't hippies yet in 1962, but even that afterwards, as far as I know, it was pretty conventional. <laughs> um, but I do, you know, but but nevertheless, it's, it's suggestive when you compare Kuhn to Putnam. Because Putnam was definitely the East Coast political. Well, right, as I said, he was in this period was standing in Harvard Square handing out Maoist literature. <laughs> right? So, um, um, and actually, one of Putnam's criticisms of Kuhn, it, it, you know, if you look back to where he discusses Kuhn in that paper, he says, you know, he says, well, Kuhn has said all these interesting things, but he says, you know, his description of this is. Scientific problems as puzzles, just like two flippers. These are really important things that are, you know, like we're trying to uh, improve the lot of mankind. And, you know, and uh, and somehow Putnam gets in as a kind of example of a scientific theory. The boss is a bastard. <laughs> right? That's one of the examples. Like, Tell the workers that that's just a conjecture that they're trying to falsify. <laughs> so, right. So, I don't know. I don't know where this is something I thought of years ago, and now I mention it when I teach this course, but I don't know how to take it any farther. Um, but I guess I'll just say one other thing in connection with it, which is that um, this like sense of oppressive bureaucracy and that it didn't much matter whether you're on the capitalist side or the socialist side was like not only didn't only have like a left-wing manifestation in the early 60s but also a right-wing manifestation right like libertarianism basically comes out of that same thing as as we know it and um and popper is basically on that side Right, I mean, that's the point of that, I think, of that remark about the modern arms race and how it's caused this pathology. Modern arms race is exactly that kind of centralized bureaucratic enterprise that is identical on both sides. That's the whole point of it, right? It's an arms race. <laughs> um, and, you know, but, but Popper's. And not that Copper is some kind of extreme libertarian, I think, but he's liberal, right? Like, so he, he thinks that the way out of this is is to like somehow loosen that structure, or, you know, open it up. Okay. Um, Oh, so, um, so that's this is all finishing talking about the reading from last time, basically. <laughs> um, it's all basically talking about normal science. 
But as I said, and you know, like as Griffin had already asked, like, so hold on a second, you know, um, why is science really good at discovering fundamental novelties? And, you know, being groundbreaking, right? Um, and, you know, and the threat to Kuhn's view is that Popper will say, so, I mean, Popper himself actually says something even stronger than this, but you can imagine Popper saying, maybe this actually is a little bit like what Lockerbie says, that, yeah, sure, most of the time science is like this. It's just fixing things up to try to improve the fit between the theory and the world. But, um, and the scientists are kind of addicted or unfree, or you can almost say they're like asleep. You know, like they're not thinking for themselves, um, so they're not enlightened. <laughs> um, but uh, when the time comes and the theory runs into serious trouble, and they realize that it's not going to work, they wake up <laughs> and they consider other theories and they test them the way Popper says you should test them. And that's when real science happens, right? That this would be like this. This would be the way someone could come back against him. So, like, even though this is what happens most of the time, in a sense, it's not right to call it normal science because this part isn't really where the science happens. The science really happens during what Kuhn is calling revolution. So, um, and so I think that's why Kuhn has to say so much about the structure of scientific revolutions and in so much detail because he wants to show what's really going on then, and that it, it's, it's not anything like that. So, so what, what does go on then, according to Kuhn? Well, there's, I mean, So I think there's two or possibly three phases of it. I mean, there's definitely two phases. So there's what Kuhn's law calls extraordinary science. And then there's revolution. But it appears that there's maybe two different types of extraordinary science. Or maybe he would classify the first type as still part of the normal science. I'm not sure. Like, as usual, his terminology is not that fixed, so it's hard to be sure. But, um, but anyway, there's a there's a a process that goes on here that um, has several different parts, and this part is definitely different from this part because Kuhn says extraordinary science doesn't necessarily lead to a revolution. Um, in the phase of extraordinary science, there's um, there's an anomaly, something that's not going as expected. Now, there's always anomalies. I mean, uh, a lot of the puzzles that normal scientists are solving are anomalies. Maybe that's not, sometimes they're solving these more, uh, like even more restricted puzzles, like they're just trying to measure some value, right? But a lot of times what they're doing is they're trying to, uh, there's a case where you can't really see how to get the observations out of the theory. And, you know, so like that's an anomaly. The observations aren't what you expect from the theory. And so they're trying to show how you can get the observations from the theory. And that's like a big part of the type of puzzles that they're solving. So, um, so there's always anomalies. But the period of extraordinary science is a, is a period where, for some reason, everyone's attention in the field has been focused on this one anomaly. 
and it has started to seem not just like another puzzle that you could solve. Let's, you know, who wants to try to solve this puzzle? But it's like a puzzle that for some reason has to be solved or we're going to go on in the field. Um, but Kuhn says, and, and of course, that for it to reach that point, it has to be a puzzle that's resisting solution. Right? Because, I mean, the, the puzzle can never get to the point where it focuses everyone's attention in the field if it's easily solved. So it's either like no one can solve it at all, or they keep thinking they've solved it, but then it doesn't work, or, you know, something like that. The anomaly um, uh, just uh, it keeps going for a long time, although that's not sufficient, right? Because remember, like the case of the perihelion of Mercury, where the anomaly persisted for a long time, um, people sometimes tried to solve it, didn't succeed, and just went on to work on other stuff, <laughs> right? No one thought it was a crisis. So, um, but 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 anyway, that's a necessary condition. It's a puzzle that's particularly resistant to being solved under the paradigm rules. And everyone gets somehow gets their attention riveted on this one puzzle. But Kuhn says, you know, um, nevertheless, sometimes this can be resolved and we can go back to normal science. And there's two different ways it can be resolved. One is maybe we do find a solution under the paradigm rules. And then everyone can go back to doing or the other is maybe we just uh, can't find a solution and after a while we give up on it and we put it aside for future research. And then I'd like to go back to doing it. <laughs> um, now, like he doesn't uh, give examples of those two things happening, he just says they can happen. I don't know what a good example would be. In the crisis that was resolved in one or the other of those ways. But anyway, he says that can happen, or the third thing that can happen is that um, someone, he says, usually it's one person, or actually he says, of course, one man, <laughs> right? One man, perhaps in the middle of the night, <laughs> suddenly it dawns on them. A new set of rules. And under the new set of rules, this puzzle has a solution. In fact, sometimes the new set of rules, and he, he says, and I don't really explain why, but this is often this happens that the new set of under the new set of rules, this puzzle won't even look like a puzzle anymore. Um, so, like an example of this would be the law of inertia. Well, actually, but maybe I should talk about this next time. Because I said I was going to talk more about extraordinary science this time, than about revolution next time. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I'll just you know, like, at least as Kuhn understands it, the, the anomaly that caused a crisis in Aristotelian dynamics was, like, attempts to explain why things keep moving um, in an unnatural way after the violent force on them has ceased. Right? So, like, Things that are made out of earth or mostly out of earth, like this chalk, naturally go towards the center. But they can be violently moved in other directions. Or they can be violently prevented from going towards the center, right? Like this. And they can also be violently moved in other directions. But the question is what if I throw the piece of chalk? As soon as it leaves my hand, there's no violent force on it anymore. Why doesn't it just fall straight down? So the question was to explain why things keep moving 
even though they're not being acted upon by an outside force. And, you know, so Newton's second law of motion is a body of motion, in motion remains in motion unless acted on by an outside force. <laughs> so first of all, that solves the puzzle, so to speak, right? Why does it keep moving when it's not being acted on by an outside force? That's exactly what things do when they're not being acted on by an outside force. But it also, it's, it's, it, but it also starts to see, and it says like a logical truth. Right, like how, and, and therefore unfalsifiable. Like how can I find a bunch of things that are not being acted on by an outside force? Well, I have to find things that aren't accelerating, right? I mean, that's how you can tell that they're not being acted on by a force. <laughs> so like to say that it's, it's not accelerating, and to say that it's not being acted on by a force are just saying the same thing in, in different words, it seems. So this thing, which was a terrible, terribly difficult problem for Aristotelian dynamics, under Newtonian dynamics turns into like a logical triviality. All right, so anyway, um, that's kind of on the side. Maybe I shouldn't have gone into it at this point because the main point is was just that. Um, so at some point, maybe this can be resolved not in a way that allows us to go back to the old normal science, but by someone coming up with a new paradigm. And now we start a new period of normal science under the new paradigm. Well, after, I mean, so even though the idea comes to someone in the middle of the night, perhaps, it takes perhaps it can take as long as a generation for this thing to completely play out so that old paradigms are replaced by the new paradigm. Um, but after that happens, we go back to normal science under the new paradigm. Um, so, uh, so, like, it is a whole account of this. What Kuhn tries to establish is. Number one, that science produces fundamental novelties inadvertently. I think he's he's kind of already taken his, takes himself to have shown that in the discussion of normal science. Number two, that when it finds fundamental novelties, it responds to them by trying to make them go away. <laughs> and number three, that it will keep doing that until someone comes up with a new paradigm. So no matter how bad things get, if there's no new paradigm, we're going to keep using them. Um, now, I mean, so then, like, Next, the reason for next time we'll talk more about what happens once we have two different paradigms on the table and how we decide to turn them. But um, so without going into that now, I'll just say, and the end result of this, if the new paradigm is accepted, that science quickly represses all memory of the old system. Um, because you know the new system can only work to establish an arena for puzzle solving if its fundamental assumptions are unquestioned. So we don't want to think about alternatives anymore. Yeah. This view of the paradigm <laughs> shift kind of sounds like religion, like the evolution of, of religious belief. I don't, I don't know, like it kind of sounds like when I, when I think of like a group in the community or a group of like a crisis of faith and they adopt a new like way of viewing their religion, it kind of sounds like that though, but uh, just like scientific paradigms. I think so. We'll see uh, in, in chapter nine, I think it is near the beginning that Kuhn makes a really strong and interesting analogy between political revolution and scientific revolution. To the extent that religious change is also a kind of political revolution, which it is, at least in part, right? Like the Reformation is a huge political event. Uh, that I think that would be included under that. I don't know what if. Well, 
the way religions change in general is yeah, it's a good question. But 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 yeah, so I think Kuhn would accept that though. Um I mean, yeah, there is something like interpreting a sacred text in order to get the answers to the questions that you're putting to it now. And hopefully, like, usable answers <laughs> um, is kind of like this puzzle solving process. It has, I guess, well, maybe even some of the pleasure people are taking in doing it. So that, yeah, I don't know, it's a good question. But okay, um, so uh, right, so the extraordinary science phase or phases are the parts where people are trying to make the problem go away. Um, and like as I said, it seems to have two parts to it. One is um, like the first phase is just um, fixation. There's fixation on the anomaly as a normal problem, right? So it's it's like people are the old paradigm is still firmly in control. And by the way, I guess I should say like. Um, some examples of this are like happen really quickly, and maybe the different phases are not so easy to separate out. Um, I guess, I mean, it's important to say, especially because I'm not going to get probably time to talk about the Kuhn's examples in detail, but you know, Kuhn thinks that in addition to these big scientific revolutions that affect a huge part of science. There are a lot of much smaller revolutions that occur within small subfields, and that, um, and that, moreover, um, even the discovery of a new phenomenon that's unanticipated, like X-rays, has kind of the structure of a scientific revolution. But you know, but in the case of these big theoretical revolutions that involve whole huge fields, it's obviously going to take longer and you're going to see a lot more detail in the structure, right? As opposed to, you know, his story about Merchant discovering x-rays, like it all happened over, I forget, a period of six weeks or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, you can still, like, you can see, like, first you try to do this, and then you try to do this, and by the end, you're just doing that, but, right, so anyway, at least in the big things, you can, there's a phase where the old paradigm is still struck fully in control, and, uh, but, but what's, what's the only thing that's extraordinary or unusual is the amount of attention that's being fixed on this one problem. Um, and uh, um, um, you know, why does that happen? Um, Kuhn says there's a lot of different possible reasons. Part A can be external factors. Someone, is, someone from outside is asking the scientist to solve this problem. Right? Like suggests that because of pressure to reform the calendar, there was a lot of um, worry about the problem of the like 
um, procession of the equinoxes around when Copernicus was working. And that's what it focused attention on that problem. But, um, um, but uh, he says, you know, there could be a lot of other explanations. I think, you know, the, the, the main thing about that is, is, is the fact that there isn't one simple explanation, right? It is, it's not that scientists are following a methodology that tells them when to take a problem that's central to their field. Kuhn says, like, when you investigate what made the problem rise to prominence, it, you know, it can be all kinds of things. It can be external pressures, it can be changes in technology, it can be changes in other fields that suddenly make this problem look important. Um, um, so, but anyway, so what happens in this phase is um, just that everyone is trying to solve this one problem. Um, now, well, I guess I'll save the second phase before I move on. So, in the second phase is um, where the old paradigm starts to break down. But we don't have a new one to, to replace it with. So this is like a kind of random groping phase. And uh, proliferating paradigm articulations. So like paradigm articulation is something that Kuhn says is one of the functions of normal science. What is paradigm articulation? Well, it's, you know, so if, um, paradigms for scientific theories in proper sense, then at least ideally, the theory would say exactly what to expect and how to test it. But paradigms are not like that. They contain like certain impressive achievements, certain uh, like laws formulated in a certain way and certain like uh, um, well-known applications that are taught. It's cool and you learn how to be a scientist. Um, but uh, it's not clear in advance how to, or it's not always clear in advance how to apply the theory to other cases that haven't been considered before. Right, so, I mean, I think, you know, in, in other words, the scientists who are all under the same paradigm, they have, they don't really have some um, easily specified set of beliefs in common or an easily listed set of rules in common. They're kind of all going along because they've all been educated with the same models. But when it comes to actually figuring out how to, like, um, use that to describe some new range of phenomena or whatever, it turns out no one has ever agreed on it. <laughs> so the puzzle is like how to, so articulating here means like, I guess making more detail, right? Like adding the little details that, you know, so like to, um, eliminating the ambiguities in what the meaning of the paradigm is. So that's the normal process of paradigm articulation. But in this case, um, Kuhn says we got a proliferation of new paradigm articulations um, to the extent that the fact that people don't really agree about what the theory means becomes obvious. <laughs> right? Like it was always true in a sense, and that's why this normal kind of articulation could happen. But at this point, it starts to become more and more obvious that we don't really know what the full distance theory is, let's say. So we don't really know what Aristotelian, the Aristotelian law of fall is, or whatever. 
right? But there's, there's ambiguities in it that we never really bothered to settle. But now, in the presence of this really difficult problem, people start like randomly trying, well, maybe the theory means this, maybe it means this. And people, and everyone gets more and more of the sense that we're not sure what it is. Um, but along with that also goes kind of random experimental work, like doing experiments just to see what will happen. So Kuhn says, you know, this is the phase where it looks most like kind of a period science, right? People are like, like making bold conjecture, conjectures and conducting experiments that they don't know what to expect from. Um, but, um, so what's the argument here to show that that's not really what they're doing? I mean, part of it is, uh, the reports of the scientists themselves. Well, I mean, okay, so part of it is just that whatever they're doing, they don't, they still don't conceive of it as testing the paradigm. With no new paradigm on the table, the only way they can keep doing what they know of as science is by somehow trying to make the old paradigm. So they're aware that something is wrong. They're acutely aware that something is wrong. But it's not that there's something wrong with the paradigm, it's something wrong with them. <laughs> right? So, like, there's this quote from uh, Wolfgang Pauli, who, who went on to become a uh, like, very famous quantum physicist. Um, and, you know, but he wrote a letter to a friend at a certain point saying, like, um, um, once again, physics is very confused, or in any way, it seems too difficult for me. <laughs> and then he also says, I wish I had been a movie comedian or something of a sort. <laughs> um, so he's very unhappy. Kuhn says, why is he unhappy? He wants to do this. He wants to solve puzzles. But all of a sudden, no one's sure what the rules are. <laughs> and there's this puzzle that we're trying to solve, and we can't solve it, and it's no fun anymore. And I wish I had done something else, right? And then um, Heisenberg publishes his paper about major mechanics. And like a few months later, probably writes another letter saying, like, now it's as if a light has shown and I can see my way forward. <laughs> and Kuhn, again, Kuhn's explanation of that is he's, Heisenberg's paper has opened up a whole new field of puzzles. <laughs> um, right? So, I mean, this is not how you'd expect a Popperian investigator to, to report the internal state of this. Stage, right? You expect them to say things are getting really exciting now because it looks like the old theory might be falsified. We're looking for a good falsifying hypothesis, and but we think you know we're going to learn a lot more about nature now. Instead, they're saying this is no fun anymore. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I is is it possible that? This stage where you know the scientists are confused and upset and not having fun is just like reflecting what Popper said. Like, like for Popper, we're we're against against our rationality. We're going to be psychologically invested in our theory anyway, so we have to we have to test it. But this is all of this like. Um, puzzle solving is, seems like maybe just the psychological invested in your theory, and that's that's why you're upset. And then eventually, you know, I don't know, someone gets an insight or something and get a new belief. But the in between is just like not a not a rational problem with science, but like just a psychological 
Right. So, I mean, that is what Popper had to say about this, but remember what he, at least as I'm reading, he was trying to do here. And now we're out of time, so I'm going to have to push this on the stop to next week, which fortunately, next week is the last week, so I can't push it off, push it off, do better than that. But anyway, um, uh, what like at least as I'm understanding, Kuhn, what Kuhn's trying to do is show that we don't have Popperian science in these periods, right? So he's trying to close off the places it could be. So basically, what you're suggesting is maybe the revolutionary period, right? Once someone has an insight, then you said, oh, now I know the paradigm is falsified, or the theory is falsified, right? So, but just, uh, I know, so Kuhn is going to discuss that too, but what he wants to say about this phase is that um, whatever scientists are doing here, it's still not what Popper said they should be doing. And yes, Popper can explain that politically, psychologically, whatever, but, um, but this is still like an anomaly for Popper's theory of science. But I don't, well, I'm out of time, so I, I, I was gonna say something about, it. this is one of the parts of the book where Kuhn most explicitly applies what he's saying about science to his own activity in the book. Maybe I'll get the chance to talk about that next time. But yeah, so does that, I mean, yes, that's that's possible, but what but but if it's true, that just helps in this point, basically. All right. Okay, I'll see you all next week.